I decided to name this talk in, into what I think is the essence of money, which is fiducia, which is the, the Latin word for trust, for uh, assurance, for confidence. And it's a critical review of the history of money, but it will be mostly about the pre-history of money, because I think uh, going into, uh, uh, focusing into that part of history will be a better way to understand in relationship to crypto asset development, what is key in, in regard to creating the protocols that can improve our uh, financial workings of the world. Because then the history of money is quite interesting, but it's just history, and it's just about the power struggles that different families, different kingdoms, different rulers made in order to accumulate power and accumulate wealth. But of course, I could have also named these uh, the um, homo monetarius instead of the homo fiducia, or the homo fiduciarius. And, and in this case, uh, because etymolo etymology is always a good way to start a conference, uh, monetarius comes from the word moneta, which uh, was the, the Latin word for uh, a title that was given to a, a Roman goddess, Juno. And just by chance, this was where uh, the Roman t uh, Empire first started to coin coin, uh, coin coins, so to where the coinage of physical uh, currency started. So it's just um, a tradition. There's no other uh, etymological basis for the word uh, moneta, or in this case, which, which is from where the word money derives, or in Portuguese, moeda, or in Spanish, moneda. It's just pure tradition. And as you'll see throughout this presentation, money and currencies, unfortunately, are mostly about tradition. And the good thing about crypto assets is that it's trying to overcome a little bit the traditional barriers that have uh, promoted uh, centuries and, and, and centuries of, of blockage just because something was used as money in the past um, and, and, and because it survived more time as being used as money. It makes us, because we are also animals of habit, to trust that medium more than others. But uh, that trust can also be uh, damaging to us. But besides uh, monetarius, besides fiduciarius, we could have also talked about the homo pecuniarius, which basically means, um, it's another word uh, for many, which is derived from actually the Latin word for cattle. Uh, in this case, uh, it's very associated with wealth because during many societies, uh, cattle was a currency, cattle was money, and it was a prime form of wealth. So, and, uh, but also land. So this was just an introductory curiosity uh, for us to warm up, and I wanted to ask the audience what they think it is money. In your definition, how would you put money into words? Everyone knows money when they see it. If I will take here uh, some money and give it to you, you will likely decide whether that was money or not. If I will give you a monopoly banknote, probably you wouldn't think that was money. But if I'll give you 20 euros, $20, some renminbi, it is likely that you will take that as money. But how do you put into words what everyone is able to perceive as money? Power. Money is power. Money is value. Money is value. Contracts for value. Language of appreciation, function, function. Medium, of medium of exchange. Very well. These are all somewhat valid definitions, uh, but what if I will tell you, for example, that if I will trade my house here in Porto with some, some of your houses in other cities, if, and, and eventually they will be the same monetary value so that none of us will be worse off in that exchange, will our houses be considered money? Exactly, there are s several properties of what is uh, money that make the definition uh, extremely complex and, 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 but also uh, makes, makes the definition possible to be blurred uh, in certain uh, aspects. Either if we look at money through time or if we look at money in specific contexts, for example, through prisons or, or in certain uh, societies. But uh, eventually, it will be interesting to note that uh, out of this uh, talk, the goal is uh, for you to go mad. Uh, the inquiry of money, as I, as I said in the beginning, is, is a big rabbit hole. If you uh, love crypto assets and love cryptocurrency and are 
devoting your free time to learning more about it. I'm sure that you will enjoy learning more about money. And out of these 25 minutes, it will be impossible for you to, and, and for me to explain uh, as much as I've, I've researched in, in a simple way. So the goal is just to spike your curiosity and entice you to go online, read some books, talk with people, think about what is money and, and, and how can money be useful for us as a society. So this was just a nice phrase from Karl Marx on Gladstone, which was a British prime minister who just <laughs> joked about how money makes men um, go crazy, just about thinking how ridiculous the concept of money is, despite being so tangible to us and being so obvious to us. And in this conversation, we are going to briefly distinguish money versus currency and, and, and narrow a little bit down the definition of money. Then we are going to try to understand where did money come from, despite many myths of the origin of money. Then we are going to talk a little bit about money in today's society. How is money created? Um, and, and, and more than how money is created, what is the role of money in, in, in our uh, financial uh, well-being from not only individuals, uh, from an individual perspective, but also from the perspective of our society, as in how is money related to, to the debt or, or that, we, that is currently uh, struggling, that we, our societies are currently struggling with, but also how is uh, money responsible or not for the economic crisis that uh, at least all of us here, here have already experienced. And then we're just going to, to have a very brief discussion of some possible takeaways for crypto assets in case any of you is developing crypto assets, and then we go on into questions and answers. But feel free to interrupt me anytime something is not clear because it's a very dense topic. Very well. So, what is money? The first definition of money uh, that is, is widely used today is one that uh, is used by, or it was popularized by historians, Neil Ferguson, uh, but also Yuval uh, Noah Ari wrote the book Sapiens and, and Homo Deus, um, and, and they are historians and anthropologists, anthropologists. And this definition is a little bit controversial because many people just cringe at the hypothesis that money is magical. They say that money, of course, it is not magical. It's based on trust, and that is somewhat true. Uh, but what's important to understand is that is this system of mutual trust. The, the part of whether it's magical or not, it, it's, it's more a part of philosophical questioning that eventually people who, who, for example, tend to favor gold as a pure form of money will, will shrug. They will say it's not magical at all. It's based on the not magical properties of gold, but on the physical properties of gold. Whereas everyone else in society eventually will think it is magical. And what's interesting to understand here is that in the end, as you were saying, and your definitions were more or less all around this matter, put simply, money is just a way for you to make a payment, for you to convince someone to give you something in return without having to rely on your social relationship with that person or that, that group. But as some of you were also saying, there are other aspects of money that comprise the textbook definition of what money is. And this is widely written all around the internet in articles about cryptocurrency, or about Bitcoin, but it's poorly understood. So we're going to devote a little bit of time in order to understand that. And, and these are the three uh, key aspects of the definition of money. So money is something that is widely considered as a means of exchange, as a means of, of storing value, and uh, as, as a way to account for that value. So it's this unit of value, this store of value, and this means of exchange. And the key word here is, is widely. This is what's important. If it's not widely used, we can, we can consider that thing as being potential money, but it's not money because it does not derive from that system of mutual, mutual trust. And this is that uh, textbook triad that, uh, that we were talking about. And um, in regard to whether what is an ownable thing? It can be an asset, it can be a commodity. Uh, it doesn't matter in so much uh, going to this definition because money is not an asset in itself because you cannot produce anything out of it, but you can buy anything with money. So in the end, it's the ultimate asset, the most liquid of, of all of them. And um, this, these are, this is the way that this is usually phrased. And I think it's self-intuitive. You can read what is there. Uh, we are going to, to understand a little bit more each of them in a moment. Now, the, um, of course, this is a simplistic framework, but it's still useful to understand the potential of something to be money. 
Now, the, the important thing to understand here is how is money different than currency? And the definition is, is a little bit of a, of a theoretical one. Currency is just a subset of, of money. So currency is the physical or virtual representation of money. If money is the system of belief, the currency is what we see and what we can touch or what we can code as money. Um, in, in this case, for example, uh, currency exists outside of our collective minds as, as the material token that is cash or that is, uh, for example, almost a credit card, but we could say that the card is not currency itself, it's just a mean to operate the currency, which in this case it's the electronic record. And um, also to go into the etymology perspective, it's nice to understand that it derives from the Latin word in circulation. So whenever we think of currency, we can think of the money that is actually in circulation. For example, in our current society today, most likely all of you have money in the bank. That, bank, that money, if it's in your uh, checking account, we can consider that money to be in circulation because you can immediately go to the ATM and withdraw it. But if that money is in your savings account, it's not necessarily in circulation because perhaps you'll need one week for it to be deposited because banks use these very old database systems that are just so slow and you have to wait one week for them to put the money into circulation, which is actually not because of the databases, it's because of another thing that we're going to understand in a moment. And just to visualize this, this is in, in regard to the global money supply in green, uh, what is uh, the, the more or less 9% of uh, physical coins and cash and bank, and, and bank notes that are in circulation compared to the rest of, of the um, money supply that is also in circulation, but that's not in physical form. And then there is more money, there is more money supply that is uh, related to, to like non-people deposits and, 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 and like the money that the central banks create for themselves to loan to other banks. But this is just to, to visualize what the green things in our pockets represent compared to the money that is on our bank accounts. Just to conclude this detour, what's interesting to note here is that, uh, for example, in, in, in the crypto asset perspective, uh, the currency will be the Bitcoin code or, or, or the tokens that we, we see moving in our wallets, whereas money will be our collective trust in the protocol, in the developers, uh, and, and, and the fact that the properties that we deem as valuable, in this case, these are the usual ones that uh, uh, money has for a person or a group of people to start using it, it must be somewhat uh, fungible, somewhat divisible, divisible, somewhat private, somewhat uh, uncensorable, uh, somewhat portable. Uh, it's our trust that this money will continue to retain these properties. So for example, the fact that gold uh, was an, and is used as, as, as money uh, for many centuries, it's mostly because it's a very stable metal that doesn't corrode like silver or bronze or and many other metals that has a very high value per, um, per weight. So you can carry a lot of money of, of, of potential um, economic value with you uh, in a very low physical form, and uh, therefore you are more safe uh, walking around with gold that you can hide in your pockets than if you are walking around with a big uh, paper check that says you have X, X money. So this is the initial overview of what is money versus currency. Now to the interesting part. What is the origin of money? In order to understand what is the origin of money, it's very interesting to consider what was a world without money. And eventually, when you think of a world without money, most of us think of a communist society. Of course, the world uh, started uh, outside of communist society, started with enter gathered tribes, and that is the origin of money. But eventually, you have learned about other origins of money. And my first question uh, to you is, anyone here has heard a different origin for money? Anywhere here? So that's not necessarily the origin, that is the representation of, of, of the money. But why did people start to use pebbles, for example? Debt. Sorry? Debt. Pet? Debt. 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 That's one. Another one? That's one of the most popular, especially these days. Honor. Barter? Honor. Honor? That one is a very good one. Uh, security reasons. Security reasons, eventually. But uh, besides debt, uh, the big, the other big conception of uh, what was the origin of money is usually uh, barter. 
the, the process of convincing someone to give you something because you want it and therefore giving that person something in return because no one will give you anything for free. So this is usually when you go into an economics class or if you learn about the history of money, um, what you learn as being the reason for money to be uh, evolving. However, this is a big myth, but debt is also a big myth. And, 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 and why is this? Uh, because it's a theoretical framework that actually started in the times of Aristotle and it was then popularized by Adam Smith in his Wealth of the Nations, that it's an interesting uh, framework. But the question is whether barter was um, an understanding for money in regard to being used in a trade context or whether it was used in the context of societies that did not necessarily trade. And um, what happens in this regard is that the belief uh, from many historians of money is that money started as barter, but not for the need of trade, because societies, intergatherer tribes, intergatherer societies did not necessarily need to trade, but they also did not necessarily have, tra uh, have debt systems. Debt, uh, from as much as we can hypothesize and, and study, started around 5,000 years ago in Mesopotamia, but there, is, uh, there are records of money that precede um, these kinds of societies that uh, are from uh, 100,000 years ago. And uh, in, this case, in, in this case, despite some people uh, regarding debt as the origin of money, it seems far more likely that it predated these market-based economies or these debt-based societies. And um, the original concept of money, as uh, understood in this case by a very famous uh, cryptographer, Nick Sabo, is that it emerged in these intergatherer tribes. And uh, why did it emerge? It emerged as a way for those tribes to cooperate, as a way for those tribes to ensure that they could meet their needs, not necessarily trade needs, but the needs of, of the small institutions that hold those tribes together, such as matrimony, such as inheritance, such as ensuring that your children will be able to, after you die, still benefit from the kind of social power you had if you were the tribe leader. Or also in war, in, in, in this case it was not institutionalized debt, but there was the payment of tribes. If you as an intergathered tribe conquered another tribe, you might have um, been able to say, okay, the tribe that lost, you can leave, but you are going to pay, you are going to have to pay as a tribe. In essence, just a simple tax. So um, in, in essence, money is a problem, um, is a problem solver for cooperation. So it is a mechanism to solve cooperation. And um, this is basically just what I was saying in written, in case you want to, to read it later, I can uh, give the slides. And uh, the primary use case for this was then to ensure that as these intergatherer tribes became more complex, you wouldn't need to track all these favors. It was not necessarily how to track all these debts, because in these small societies, this were, was more about favors, such as in, in our families, we sometimes lend money to, to our uh, sisters, for example, but we do not consider that a debt, we consider that a favor. And sometimes if we start uh, eventually lending money to our cousins, we might want to consider that a favor we want to track, but it's still different than debt. So this is just a conceptual origin of money. And uh, I'm going to pass the next slide over, but we can talk about it later on if you are very cu curious of it. Um, but very briefly, the only thing that I want to mention here is that then the thing that is considered as, as money should be durable and eventually should be uh, wearable. As, as you were saying, like the shells, it, it, it were things that you could put in necklaces or you can put in, in armbands so that you could easily carry them because you didn't have furniture. The, the people just live walking around in tribes. So they needed to be objects that were rare, scarce, because due to market demand, people admired things that were scarce and, and therefore portable as well and as durable as possible. That's why eventually people started moving from shells and, and from glass beads to the precious metals that uh, govern our admiration for shiny things. So um, in the end, and I'm also going to, to skip a little bit through this part, the important thing to understand here is that the origin of money is not about uh, being either just a store of value or a medium of exchange or an unit of account is about being the free together, but in a sense, yeah, thank you, I have here the time. 
but in essence, it's derived from the fact that uh, uh, as soon as something is perceived as being able to drive, or, or not drive, but to store value over the long term, that thing then starts to be used as a medium of exchange, as a way to transfer the wealth between y your society. And the most important and interesting fact about something to conclude its process of being defined as money is at the moment in which people start considering it as a unit of account. What this means? That, for example, perhaps you have bought stuff with Bitcoin here. Perhaps you have some of your savings in Bitcoin because you trust its properties to preserve value of the, over the long term. But when you go buy a croissant outside, do you think that the croissant costs one euro or uh, 200 satoshi? Most likely you think it costs one euro. So eventually something will only become money when our abstract notion of what uh, things cost in our society, of what is our ability to purchase something, is uh, conceived within that unit of account. So eventually cryptocurrency will only become money when we stop thinking of the cost of things in terms of cents of dollars or of pounds or of euros, but when we start thinking of them, in the case of Bitcoin, in satoshis. So then we have here a long explanation of this that I will just follow through. Very briefly on this over the next two minutes, and then the takeaways for crypto assets uh, and, and some other parts will, will, will remain for a wider conversation that we can have. And I'll also try to, I love this topic, I'll also try to conceptualize this in written form over the internet over the next couple of months. <coughs> on the monetary status quo, after we understood how money is originated, how our system of mutual trust comes to be, it's very interesting to understand how is money created so that we can understand how crypto assets that we create out of code can actually become trusted by a wide group of people. And in this regard, this is a nice meme. I think everyone has this childish story. Everyone just thinks ATM produces money, but everyone knows they don't. So what is fiat money? Fiat money is, is just money that is considered legal by a government. And it can be either fully backed by precious metals or not. So I'm just going to go all over this text. It's irrelevant for now. What's more interesting is how is fiat money then created? Well, if fiat money is fully backed, then uh, fiat money is just created by printing paper notes or issuing coins that are redeemable by the back of precious metals that we consider, due to the previous understanding of what was valuable, to be a coin in the long term. However, in today's society, there is practically no 100% um, back of fiat currency. All currencies operate on what we call a fractional reserve system. What does this mean? That if we want to redeem our paper notes or our coins for precious metals, we cannot. So how do we create money? Uh, because it's not just about printing paper, because if it was, all of us could print paper at home and be rich. It's about having a system in place that allows money to be created in regard to the market demand for the money. And here there are very interesting myths that we can all talk about later, but I only have 30 seconds to conclude. So I'm just going to be very brief about this. <coughs> There's another myth about money besides the death myth or the barter myth. That is the, the myth that banks create money out of reserves. However, I'm going to tell you a secret. Money, uh, banks create money if you want and if they trust you, of course. So there is another myth in this textbook, uh, textbooks of economics that says that money is created as long as a bank has a reserve that then is multiplied uh, when they grant a loan to you. But the interesting thing is that money don't need reserves, sorry, banks don't need reserves to grant you money. If you walk out or if you walk into a bank and if the bank trusts you and if you ask for a loan, the bank has the power to just go into their system and create that money for you. Then, if you want to take that money out in cash, in paper notes, then the bank has to be lucky enough, responsible enough, to have that physical cash or physical notes in their coffers and give any doubt to you. Because most people just walk out of the bank with their money as an electronic record in their bank accounts. Banks can create money at their will, or almost at their will. To conclude, banks create their money as long as they are able to borrow money from central banks. So the only mechanism in our society to regulate money supply is the interest rate, because that's the cost that the banks have to borrow their money. So 
this is the overview of how Fiat Man is created. The, this presentation is extremely more wide, but I'll, I'll open the floor to questions and uh, I can publish it later and I'll be open to questions. If you just uh, Google my name, Hugo, it will be very easy to, to find me out on, on Twitter or on email. 